hello students good morning welcome back so we are going to start with the daily current affairs uh, today you will have 28th of december 2020 and uh, we have also covered the comprehensive new news analysis for the two, for 28th of december 2020 myself pushpendra singh and uh, you can refer or you can join uh, this channel of the future ias classes for your daily current affairs okay i i am taking basically the two newspapers preferably the hindu newspaper okay this is my first reference and my sec second reference is indian express okay you can also refer these two newspapers the hindu newspaper and the indian express newspaper and get your daily current affairs news all right you can also refer our channel where you can also get it out the the glimpse of the daily current affairs news all right so let's begin with our uh, the lecture all right so the first news which is flashing in the newspaper is iceberg a68 all right so the iceberg you know it is basically a part of the bigger continental glacier right which is basically lying in uh, in the arctic region or in the antarctic region all right so you have the two basically uh, you know the frozen continents the one is is one the one is basically arctic another is basically antarctic right they are completely frozen and because of the climate change and because of the anthropogenic effects now this ice world is basically started disintegrating from the parent glaciers right which are basically lying in the in the antarctic region because of the climatic climatic changes now it is not you know a very uh, you know uh, as common process as it, as it is but it is it has been accelerated because of the anthropogenic effects right because of the greenhouse gases like like carbon dioxide methane nitrous oxide and other anthropogenic gases which has led to the the increase increase in the average temperature or average atmospheric temperature right and which has led to the melting of the ice now one such glacier which belongs to the antarctic region right or which belongs to the antarctica is called the a65a which have which have been named by the scientific communities right so this glacier this glacier is basically has caused a bit concern for the south georgia island the south georgia island is basically also located in uh, basically south georgia island is basically a british overseas territory right which is basically the rimbon test island of you know the british uh which is also located nearby your uh, the antarctic region so the news which is coming out is that the giant iceberg right which is the biggest free floating ice so iceberg you can say is a free freely floating ice right which is which has basically disintegrated from the antarctica antarctica region and it is of size of 5800 square kilometers you can think of the size 5800 square kilometers now this iceberg have been drifting right in the antark in the atlantic region since 2017 onward so if you see the world map if you see the world map there is at the southern region at the southern extremity or the southern pole right is surrounded by the antarctica so antarctica is itself is a continent right it is completely frozen now <coughs> now this antarctica region is also bounded by the atlantic ocean right so the iceberg which is a freely floating ice from the antarctica which has broken down from this you know the bigger isle bigger you know the frozen island uh, frozen continent and that has been continuously drifting and it has drifted too long right that it has reached to antarctica it has reached to atlantic ocean because the atlantic ocean basically you know adjoining your antarctica uh, basically antarctica region all right so uh, so that basically is drifting since 2017 onward this year this year 2020 due to the oceanic current so what is the mechanism of propelling this iceberg is basically through primarily through the oceanic currents because oceanic currents are only you know uh, the mechanism in the oceans which can basically drift any body including your iceberg so this iceberg have been propelling into the south atlantic ocean right because the southern most portion of the atlantic is south south atlantic ocean where the, where it is basically drifting and now it has been drifting since then in the remotest you know sub antarctic island of the south georgia which is also the british overseas territory now it is of greater concern because of the because of the effect which it can cause 
to the the overseas territory which is also called the south georgia now the scientific community or the scientist community basically has prompted the fears about the impact of the ice work right that can cause on the island of the south georgia right on the islands abundant wildlife because you must understand right as soon as this big ice work which reaches to this island which is also called you know south georgia which may cause certain other changes in the in the in the basically oceanic realm for example it would suddenly increase the temperature it would change the phenomena of the cold current and the warm currents you might have heard about in the in the oceanography of the geography where it can change you know the 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 currents flowing basically in the in the oceanic in the oceanic part it can change the temperature it can change the density di differentiation it can change you know the change in in terms of the salinity so it can cause multiple changes okay so that can impact the islands abundant wildlife right nobody knows or nobody is sure about what could be the possible you know impact of those wildlife on those wildlife but it will certainly cause certain changes or certain disruptions right this ice work basically travel with the oceanic currents and they can basically caught up or they can basically you know settle somewhere in the shallow waters right or in the ground themselves right if it settle somewhere in the shallow waters obviously it started melting because of the changes in the temperature that the the water may rise because that because of the area of such big ice work right it may cause also the density differentiation salinity differentiation the temperature variations right all sort of things may also cause which may cause certain changes in the in the native uh, you know um, the wildlife right and uh, recently the us nation center nation ice center which is also called unnic confirmed that the two new ice work which have been carved from the parent a65a a68a right? a A68A. so this is the parent ice work which was drifting since 2017 onward now from this parent ice work the two new ice work have been carved out right with uh, they have been named also so they have been named at a a68e and a68f right they are called basically a68e and a68f which which may also cause certain changes in the adjoining part also okay so uh, this is the news which is flashing out so you can just say that a big ice work which is named as a68 which have which have been drifting away from that from the antarctic region and now it is drifting away so so right in the southern atlantic region that it reaches to the sub antarctic island of southern georgia which is a british overseas overseas territory now the scientific community uh, you know are in the in the in the in the doubt that it may cause certain adverse implications on the islands abundant wildlife because it may change uh, the salinity temperature variations density variations in the oceanic region and which may cause certain changes in the uh, in the in the, the in the currents of the oceanic realm right so which is also not good for uh, the wildlife okay and uh, and recently it has been also confirmed that this big iceberg have also you know uh, uh, and ha have also divided into two portions which are which have itself been named called a68e and a60f 68f all right so this is basically the southern georgia island and this is basically an ice work right which is of 1853 square miles or in terms of the square kilometer you can say it is 5800 square kilometers right and this is basically southern georgia island which is a british overseas territory in the atlantic region in the southern atlantic region adjoining the uh, basically your antarctica island all right let's understand the second news which is the governor's role in the calling an assembly session so first of all let me understand uh, let me give you a brief understanding about the governor's role in basically calling the assembly session okay it is a part of your polity so first of all you must understand that article article 174 of the constitution says that the governor has the power right governor has only the power or the it is the governor's power that it may call from time to time okay the members of the state legislative assembly right uh, to meet right uh, in the regular session so that means the governor from the time to time right it basically send a summons summons means a to call an invitation to the member of the legislative assembly that you please come and meet please come and meet and start your session so that power basically rest with the governor rest with the governor now 
now you must understand there are the two types of powers or there are the two different types of power which have been given to the governor the one is called basically discretionary power the discretionary power okay this discretionary power is basically used by the governor without aid and advice of without aid and advice of the council of ministers all right and second is called basically the powers which are used by the governor on the aid and advice of the council of ministers but that, that means the power which is discretionary the governor can you know use that power without any concern or without any uh, you know the aid and advice of the council of ministers but those powers which has to be compulsorily exercised only when the governor receives certain you know uh, uh, certain you know uh, uh, the the certain you know in terms of the aid and advice then only the governor can basically exercise such power so this power of you know uh, calling uh, or summoning the member of the member of the legislative assembly to meet in the session is not a discretionary power but it is it is basically compulsory exercise on the aid and advice of council of ministers so that thing you must understand that it is not a discretionary power but it is in compulsory power which have been exercised by the governor on the aid and advice of council of minister if the governor you know call the session the session would be uh, you know uh, void that session would be void so what is the news in the today's newspaper that the kerala governor okay uh, the the chief minister of the kerala that is called or the, his name is basically pinarai vijayan the chief minister went to basically the governor's office and he he basically you know uh, asked or requested the governor of the kerala for a special sitting of the assembly okay now why he was calling for the special session of the assembly so that the chief minister the chief minister of the kerala who is also the pinarai vijayan can debate right on the three farm bills or three center farm bills which have been recently made by the central government now to discuss that bills a separate sitting was requested by the chief minister of kerala to the kerala governor but what happens is the kerala governor basically turned down turned down means he refused he refused to give right uh, he refused to grant a special session right uh, uh, to to discuss these three central farm laws now this has raised a question this has raised a question uh, on the powers of the governor right whether whether to call a special sitting or whether to call a special session is a discretionary power or it's an exercise based on the aid and advice of council of ministers the constitution says that it should be exercised on the aid and advice of the council of ministers but by rejecting the request of the chief minister of kerala pinarai vijayan the request of for this the request for this special sitting is termed to be unconstitutional right so it has it has it has led to the debate on the powers of the governor whether the governor can turn down the request or not so as i told you first of all the article 174 is related to the governor's power right to summon uh, the member of legislative assemblies right from time to time to meet at such time and such place he thinks that means for a new sitting of a new session the basically the governor send an invitation that please you come and sit here and and basically start your sitting all right but you must understand the provision also puts on the governor the responsibility of ensuring that the houses is summoned at least once every 6 months so that thing is constitutionally mandate that there cannot be there cannot be more than 6 months gap between the two between the two sessions of the or between the two sittings of the house that means अगर आपको सिटिंग्स करानी है चाहे वो लोकसभा की हो चाहे स्टेट लेजिस्लेटिव असेंबली हो राइट फॉर एनी फॉर एनी हाउस मैक्सिमम गैप बिटवीन द टू सिटिंग्स शुड नॉट बी मोर देन सिक्स मंथ इसका मतलब इट्स वेरी वेरी सिंपल दैट इन एवरी सिंगल ईयर एटलीस्ट टू टाइम्स एटलीस्ट टू टाइम्स ईच हाउस शुड मीट दैट मीन्स इन ए वन ईयर एटलीस्ट टू टाइम्स द हाउस शुड मीट सो दैट इज कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल मैंडेट okay that is all together a different thing now 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 this is basically a governor's 
prerogative to summon the house right now you must understand according to article 163 this article 163 says that the governor is required to act on the aid and advice of cabinet now the cabinet is basically headed by the, uh, the headed by chief minister who was penarai bijan now now by by just you know uh, you know uh, you know rejecting the request it has led to the debate in the uh, in the basically uh, in the political sphere now 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 when the governor summons the house under article 174 right whether this is uh, his discretionary power or this is not his discretionary power it is under now it debate all right so under you can think of that in the kerala the government belongs to the left right the cpi basically rule uh, the the kerala but the center the center you have the bjp government now both are at the loggerheads of of you know or or for the maximum power capture right so the thing is that the center the governor is appointed by the center and the governor is nothing but the agent of the center like the governor has a dual role he is also the head of the state head of the kerala okay the head of the state of kerala and he is also he is also the agent of the president agent of the president that means he is appointed by the president right on the recommendations of the the center so that means the governor has no security of the tenure he can remove the governor that means president can remove the governor at any time there is no security of the tenure first of all so under such circumstances right the governor can be forced to do certain type of acts which is which is one such act the governor is doing and many such you know uh, uh, many such political interferences also was done before also by the governors on the uh, on the pretext of on the pretext of the center the center has uh, definitely would have given certain advice to the governor to do the same thing all right so this is the second news which is flashing okay so he is basically the governor of uh, the kerala and he is basically the chief minister of the kerala all right let's begin the new news which is the nuclear reactor on the moon okay now the usa uh, us is planning the united states of america is planning to have the first nuclear reactor okay the nuclear reactor on the moon by the end of 2026 okay now what is the need of having this nuclear reactor on the moon because you must understand uh, the usa is planning to you know uh, uh, to uh, to basically to get the impetus on the lunar missions okay the lunar mission the mission which is related to the moon and the mission which is related to beyond the moon right say for the mars right for discovering certain things on the mars now it required the power because from the earth if you send any spacecraft it may not survive or it may it may need certain type of energy or even if you send some of the manned mission in the moon you need to uh, you need to send them on the on the longer period of the time because if you want to explore say uh, from the moon to the mars right so you need certain energy that should be generated at the moon right for that thing you need a power reactor you need a power reactor so the us is planning to set up one such power reactor on the moon so that it can explore further beyond the moon right obviously including moon and beyond the moon say up to the uh, uh, mars now the us department of energy right which have been collaborated with the nasa is basically you know soliciting such industry design proposals in early 2021 itself now which has recently got an impetus with you know uh, the outgoing president of the usa donald trump which has recently issued the national strategy for space nuclear power and the propulsion so this national strategy for the space nuclear power and the propulsion has led to the the impetus to the recent you know uh, the idea of setting up of the first such nuclear plant or first such nuclear reactor on the surface of the moon by the end of 2026 okay now now what is happening is under this mission right the nasa is going to initiate the fission reactor okay the fission surface power project which is basically the nuclear fission there are two types of reactions first of all right those who are from the i mean from the science background they can they can easily understand the two types of reaction nuclear fission reaction and nuclear fusion reactions okay so this would be the fission reaction so it will be the nuclear fission surface reactor project for the lunar surface and that will be demonstrated by 2027 okay and that reactor will give you a power of 40 kilowatt electric watt right so it will give you uh, that much power and right and that can basically sustain 
the lunar the lunar mission as well as the exploration to the mars itself okay now now how would you set up such system basically on the surface of the moon so first of all you must understand it it is it will be first of all assembled right it will be first of all assembled uh, on on the earth itself that means all sort of a hardware and the software systems related to this uh this basically you know the fission reactor would be assembled or would be integrated with the lander lander ka matlab hota hai that part of the lunar mission which will ultimately land on the surface of moon so that lander will be integrated with this uh this nuclear fission react reactor and and when it land on the surface of the moon the reactor will also accompanied with this lander right so this power system which is having the nuclear reactor which ultimately benefits such type of the hum the human explorations as well as the future robotic explorations and the missions on the surface of the moon as well as on the mars all right and you must understand such such a reactor would be you know integrated with this lander and that will be fully manufactured that will be fully manufactured and assembled on the earth and it will be integrated on the lander as a payload payload ka matlab hota hai that part which will which can be basically you know uh, can be detached over the period of the time and can can work independently right for a for a couple period of the time for example this payload which is called a nuclear fission reactor which will which will work or which will be designed to operate for up to 10 years that means ek bar install kar diya that will continue to work for another 10 years right now this system will consist of the four major subsystems okay these four major subsystems are called the nuclear reactor okay it is the central unit where the energy would be produced right the, and the second is basically electric power conversion unit so where the nuclear energy would be converted into the electric energy so it is called electric power conversion unit and you also have the heat rejection array where certain set of heat will be rejected outside and power management and the distribution system where you will have you know uh, at the outlet you will have certain set of the management of this power and the distribution subsystem where in the future missions can also get certain power from this you know uh, this uh, you know the nuclear reactor on the surface of the moon so it will be very critical and the crucial for uh, you know uh, for these missions right so this fission surface power systems uh, would definitely meet those requirement for uh, you know uh, for the future robotic missions and the human exploration missions which will be ultimately sent to the moon as well as on the mars beyond the beyond the moon and uh, definitely those explorations and the missions would definitely require the power because if for example if say 10 human uh, went to the moon for the exploration of the mars they can temporarily make their shelter on the surface of the moon isn't it but to make the temporary shelter on the on the surface of the moon they need certain energy so that energy they can get it from this uh, from this reactor right so that is uh, you know that is how it can basically help uh, the future robotic and the human exploration missions which will ultimately send to the moon and the mars all right so this is what is uh, the news which is coming or uh, this is very very important and it is uh, the new news also all right next news let's begin so next news is monpa handmade paper okay so first of all let's understand what is this monpa what is this monpa so first of all this it is basically a it is basically a paper making paper made skill that means uh, a, a monpa handmade paper is basically famous in arunachal pradesh okay so it is basically a thousand year old heritage art so at one point of the time at one point of the time in the ancient and the ancient period the monpa handmade paper was originated around 1000 years ago in the arunachal pradesh region now uh, this art this art especially in the tawang region of arunachal pradesh now this art this art become so integrated part of the local customs and the culture of the tawang region of arunachal pradesh that every household every household Uh, uh in the tawang region basically produce this handmade paper and 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 you know uh, when every household producing this handmade paper now it has become a source of the livelihood for the locals right which is basically producing this paper all right so now it 
it is a part of the uh, the local customs it is a part of the local cult culture of the tamang region and the monpa handmade paper is very fine paper very fine textured paper now the news which is coming out is that the 1000 year old this heritage art which is also called the monpa handmade paper which is basically famous in the tamang region of the arunachal pradesh now has has come to the light once again with the effort of the khadi and village industrial commission all right so uh, you must understand two things first of all it is a 1000 years old art and it is basically mainly concentrated in the tawang region of arunachal pradesh and it is a age age old tradition of uh, the manufacturing of the paper and this was basically practiced by the the local household as a part of the local custom and the culture especially in the tawang region of arunachal pradesh all right this is this paper which is also called monpa is basically fine textured handmade paper it is made up of hand it is not made up of any sort of a manufacturing plant or any sort of a you know machines it is a handmade paper now it is also called in in their own native language moon shugu moon shugu moon shugu right in the in the local dialect it is a vibrant culture of the local tribes which is which is residing in the tawang okay, all right now uh, now you must understand this paper initially was initially had some uh, you know historic and religious significance right why this paper is integrated into the culture and the customs of the tribal people of the tabang first of all you must understand because because this paper was associated with the buddhist scriptures okay uh, uh, the buddhist writings the buddhist hymns in the monasteries were used to written down on these papers on these papers which are called basically the monpa paper or which are in the local dialect which are also called moon shugu moon shugu so they are associate their association with the 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 religious you know the affiliations uh, say the buddhist writing the buddhist hymns were basically written down on this paper so which has led to the integration of those papers in the culture and the and the customs of the tawang region now now uh, now first of all you must understand uh, uh, this paper also has certain additional value also and how will how will this paper would be made this paper would be made uh, you have to take the bark out from the tree and through the bark you will ultimately make this paper and on this paper you can write it down right so it is a handmade paper which will be which will be made by the people of the which will be made by the people residing in the tabang region right it is a totally handmade and which is also called the mong shugu because it is made up of the bark of the local tree tree ka naam tree ka naam hai shugu sheng shugu sheng theek hai the shugu sheng is basically the name of the tree the name of the tree okay and uh, and the paper is called in the native language moon shugu okay so it is the shugu is basically taken from the tree name and moon is basically associated with with the local dialect so moon shugu is the paper name okay and and the bark of the local tree you must understand is also called the shugu sheng right which has certain medicinal value also all right so this is basically a news which is flashing on the uh, on the newspaper so you can say that the khadi and village industrial commission has made a great effort right to revive uh, uh, to revive the 1000 year old the heritage art which is also called the monpa handmade paper right which has led to the further you know emphasis on their uh, on their renewal right uh, for uh, renewal of these arts especially in the tawang region of arunachal pradesh all right so this is the news which is coming out so this is you know the people of the tawang region is making the paper out of the bark of the tree which is also called shugu sheng and the and this paper is called also called the mon shugu all right let's understand the next news which is the marathwada rail rail coach factory okay so first of all you must understand there is a PC, psu with the railways which is called rail vikas nigam limited okay that is called rvnl 
so the rvnl which is also called the rail vikas nigam limited has commissioned a new rail coach factory rail coach factory ka matlab hota hai the factory which basically manufacture the rail coaches rail coaches jisme aap travel karte hain they are simple the rail coach factory jaise kapoor thala rail, rail coach factory okay so uh, so the same rail coach factory have been commissioned in the marathwada region of uh, in in the maharashtra which is basically in the latur district of maharashtra so marathwada is the region's name and latur is basically a district in the maharashtra so in the latur district the rail vikas nigam limited has commissioned a factory for the production of the coach for the indian railways all right now uh, now you must understand this factory uh, especially in the marathwada region uh, especially at the latur district of maharashtra would contribute uh, in overall development of this region because ultimately it will fulfill the the deficit of the the finest coaches which will be you know uh, with you know uh, with advanced you know features or with advanced you know certain certain features which may be integrated into the the indian railways now uh, the initial capacity of this factory would be 250 such coaches per annum so 250 such coaches per annum would be made in this factory and uh, a 5 km or uh, long rail connectivity has been provided for the movement of these coaches okay so you must understand once these coaches will be coming out from this railroad from this you know rail coach factory right from this factory to uh, to basically the electronically interlocked you know uh, the railway station which is also called the harangul railway station this harangul railway station which is the nearest one so there it can it can uh, it can easily you know these uh, these uh, you know uh, the coaches can come and they can be integrated into the indian railways all right so this is basically was previously used you know for only a halt station now it will now it will be connected to this uh, the rail coach factory which will be ultimately set up or which has ultimately set up in latur district of maharashtra so this is the this is the basically you know map of the maharashtra so i was talking about this region of the marathwada where the factory have been uh, the rail coach factory have been uh, located or have been you know manufacture have been uh, you know commission okay next the next news is basically namgars namgars so first of all you must understand what is this namgars is all about okay so first of all the namgars are nothing but the traditional vaishnavite monasteries of assam okay traditional vaishnavite monasteries of assam okay the vaishnavites mean those those saints which basically profess the vaishnavite traditions monasteries are those places where the monks used to stay and of the assam means it is a native part it is a native tradition of assam so vaishnavite monasteries of the assam which are also known as namgars namgars so ultimately the namgars means the prayer house where the monks used to perform or where the the congregation where the people used to assemble okay and they used to perform certain prayers certain prayers so they are associated with this prayer house okay all right so what is the news okay after covering a brief introduction about the namgars let's understand uh, the logic or let's understand the news which is flashing the news which is flashing is that the union home minister who is also called the amit shah distributed a financial grants of 8000 namgars okay now uh, these are basically nothing but uh you know uh the vaishnavite monasteries of assam so so 8000 such vaishnavite monasteries right, which are which are existed in the state of assam under assam darshan program now amit shah has distributed the financial grants to such such vaishnavite monasteries right in the state of assam under assam darshan program right now this is what is the news is coming now let's understand about the namgars let's understand about the namgars okay so as i told you the namgars are nothing but the prayer house where the vaishnavai saints right or where the congregation worship was used to be uh, uh, you know performed where the entire assamese community and the iksarna sect of the hinduism right uh, basically which are the native to the assam used to uh, used to perform certain prayer in the house and that is called basically namgars all right now now you must understand besides of associating 
this namgar uh, as a primary structure for the worship right you must understand they are also function as a meeting house as a meeting house where a uh, lot of people used to come and discuss right regarding uh, the best nevised traditions as well as it is also used for performing certain theaters for the dramatic performance and such dramatic performance that were that were performed right uh, uh, within or inside the namgars are called basically bauna they are also called bauna so right so what is uh, you know uh, the the namgars are associating the namgars are associating primarily with the prayer house so there the congregation of the peoples from the assamese community from iksarna sect of the hindus used to come and used to worship right the second most important the second most important of the function of you know uh, of this namgars it's basically you know people used to come and meet over there and the third basically function is where they can also perform certain theaters for the dramatic performance and such performance are called basically bauna bauna now uh, as i told you the namgars means you have the prayer house you have the prayer house it is also called kirtan ghar it is a similar thing kirtan performance of the kirtan or performance of the prayer in a house in a house right so uh, so here you will have the central structure here you will have the central structure where the where the monasteries of the iksarna religion okay uh, uh, they have basically you know uh, positioned around it so it is called satras so satras are basically you know uh, you know they have been assembled over there and they perform certain type of kirtans over there now now this namghars which were also called the prayer house or the kirtan ghars they were introduced in the state of assam by the besnavai saints first of all you must understand these kirtan ghars are associated with you know uh, with the besnavai monasteries now they have been introduced definitely by those saints which belongs to or which profess this besnavai tradition isn't it so these namghars are basically introduced in the state of assam by these besnavai saints now these vaisnavai saints which were which are very famous right they are also called shankar deva second mahadeva or madhavada deva or damodarna deva so these three saints are most famously associated with this uh, namghars for especially for the assamese people and you must understand uh, there you can basically perform certain devotion songs or you can perform certain devotions or the the bhakti which is also called the devotion to the god right so namgars are nothing but the kirtan ghars where the vaishnavai traditions of the vaishnavites used to perform certain certain religious prayers certain religious devotional works right over there and this this namgars are used to associated with you know uh, with you know performance of certain you know uh, you know a dramatic performance which is also called in the native language bauna and it is also you know used as a congregation you know a uh, room where where the people used to come and meet over there and discuss lot of things on the uh, on the vaishnavai traditions all right so this news is basically coming out related to the namgars is very very important for your prelims right you just take this namgars definitely one question will be arising in the prelims questions regarding the namgars all right the next ayushman bharat pm j sah sehat okay so ayushman bharat you know it is basically nothing but uh, you know a financial you know uh, insurance facility where you will you will have the financial care and the surgical procedure for and that will have the financial cover of 5 lakhs rupees per family all right so this scheme was launched throughout the india already launched but now recently the prime minister narendra modi has launched this scheme which is called the ayushman bharat pm j sehat yojana under this yojana the ayushman bharat scheme which was already launched has now extended to the all residents of the jammu and kashmir now for your understanding you must understand previously the the residents which were covered under this scheme was only 6 lakhs families now by extension of this pm by extension of this ayushman bharat pmj sehat yojana 
now the benefit of this scheme will be extended to all residents of the jammu and kashmir so instead of just 6 lakh families of the state now all 20 lakh families of the state will get the benefit of the ayushman bharat pmj sehat now now under this scheme a financial cover of 5 lakhs rupees per family will be provided and it will be provided for in patient care in the hospitals as well as in the surgery procedures as well as in the surgery surgical procedures all right and uh, and uh, the another benefit which is uh, which is accruing from this uh, from this scheme is that it is for the jammu and kashmir resident especially for those it is not it is not compulsory that they should take the treatment which is limited to the hospitals of the jammu and kashmir only but they can take the treatment from anywhere from any part of the country right from these hospitals which are empaneled which are empaneled under the scheme so that means the residents of the jammu and kashmir can take the you know uh, the treatment right from any part from any, from any part of the from any part of the country right uh, from those hospitals which have been empaneled which have been empaneled empaneled under these uh under this scheme all right so this will be an added benefit for the residents of the jammu and the kashmir all right so this is the news which is flashing and it is basically a, a, a photo you can see here prime minister narendra modi which launched the ayushman bharat pmj sehat which is which has extended the coverage to all jammu and kashmir residents right all 26 21 lakh families will be benefiting out of it and uh, and it is basically you know uh you know according to the atal bihari bajpayee dictum of the insaniyat jammuriyat and kashmiriyat right which has guided the prime minister narendra modi to extend the scheme to all residents of the jammu and kashmir all right so this would be the uh, this is the news let's understand the new news that is called thowal multi purpose project so first of all you must understand the thowal multi purpose project which is also associated with thowal dam this thowal multi purpose project and thowal dam both are uh, located in basically in the imphal which is also a capital of manipur which is also a capital of manipur so right so the union home minister who is the amit shah launched a several developmental projects in the state of manipur in the state of manipur so recently uh, the the union home minister amit shah has inaugurated through uh, the virtual mode the e office and thowul multi purpose project which is also has the thowul dam in the in the in the in the in the district of in the capital of imphal through the virtual mode and this thowul multi multi purpose project will irrigate the 35000 hectares of the land and which will ultimately benefit the farmers of manipur the farmers of the manipur all right and along with this thowul multi purpose project which was inaugurated by amit shah the amit shah also laid a foundation stone for the for the number of projects like the the churan chandpur medical college and idscz at the mantri pukri okay and manipur bhavan in the new delhi so these three projects will be uh, will be uh, you know uh, would be proceed because it has already laid a foundation and also the integrated command and the control center which will be uh, which will be uh, you know uh, constructed at imphal in the manipur right so and uh, so all such projects have been recently laid a foundation by you know uh, by the union home minister amit shah now all right now you must understand the previously these projects were also abandoned right why these projects were abandoned because all right uh, because you must understand now these projects were basically you know uh, have 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 now been done under the leadership of modi because uh, because in the previous government which has abandoned these projects now which has uh, you know further you know uh, get impetus to uh, to fulfill those projects under the leadership of modi all right let's understand the new news which is called umba village umba village so this umba umba is basically a village in the ladakh region of jammu and kashmir so ladakh now become a union territory so you must understand the umba village uh, does not have the electricity even today right so the umba village which is a 60 kilometers away from the district headquarters of kargil theek hai which is situated right uh, 
at the elevation of 30 13000 feet height so it is located at 13000 feet height right which is not connected with the electricity now this village which is also called umba village now had has got the electricity connection okay now uh, until now it, this village does not have the electricity with them now this has given the electricity connection right uh, this connection which was provided to umba village under the guidance of the kargil renewable energy development authority which is uh, which is basically you know uh, authority which was responsible for providing the renewable energy for the far flung areas of the region of kargil all right now now this uh, this you know uh, this uh, electricity which was provided it was provided uh, under the global himalayan expedition in partnership with the csr projects of the royal enfield okay the csr projects under royal enfield which has recently installed the 17.5 kilowatt solar electricity system in the umba village and this solar electricity system is providing the electricity to the umba village all right so this is what is the news which is flashing so the news related to umba village you must understand in the short is that the umba village till now has not has not connected with the electricity now uh, now this has recently been corrected to the electricity now the electricity is provided through the solar electricity system right uh, 17.5 kilowatt uh, the solar electricity system have been installed in the village of umba and this umba is located 13000 13000 you know uh, feet height right which is also the 60 kilometers away from the district headquarters of kargil and it has been provided with the csr projects of the royal enfield which has recently installed this uh, this uh, the solar electricity system in the village of umba all right let's understand the new news which is arya rajendran it is very very important and which is flashing so arya rajendran was arya rajendran is a basically is a female uh, which which is born basically in the year of 1999 so you must understand she is just 21 years old she is just 21 years old and she is a indian politician who currently become the mayor of tiruvananthapuram corporation okay so now let's understand who can become the mayor who can become or what is the eligibility to become a mayor so first of all uh, first of all any councillor can become a mayor so first of all you have to become a councillor okay so under corporation there is, the corporation area is divided into different different wards okay from each ward there is a one member which will be elected so that is called single member constituency which is also called the ward in uh, the corporation so there for each member they are called councillor so that means the councillor basically represent a separate ward under corporation so uh, so so the arya rajendran she has she she won the councillor from the basically munda one mukul ward of tiruvananthapuram corporation now she has been recently you know uh, elected as a mayor at the age of 21 and she was appointed as a mayor of corporation now which is also her youngest mayor of the tiruvananthapuram tiruvananthapuram corporation so which is also the youngest mayor the youngest mayor of tiruvananthapuram corporation okay now uh, one record which is there in the guinness book of records okay so guinness world record has recorded the youngest mayor in the world in the world which is named as the michael sessions the michael sessions who become the youngest mayor in the world uh, uh, in the hill in the hillsdale in the usa at the age of 18 years in the year of 2005 so so the so the guinness world record has recorded the michael sessions who become the youngest mayor in the world at the age of 18 and uh, and in india this record has gone to suman kohli who has become the mayor of bharatpur rajasthan right who she has become the mayor of the bharatpur rajasthan at the age of, at the at the age of 21 years in the year of 2009 and she was the youngest mayor who who ever elected in india right from uh, from a from a district of rajasthan which is also called the bharatpur and this bharatpur is famous for the bird century the bird century which is also called the keola dev bird century all right so these are the news which are coming in today's newspaper all right so let's uh, let's move further all right so she is basically you know the arya rajendran all right so that's all for the today's news 
guys so we will meet again enjoy your uh, the newspaper reading all right don't forget to read the newspaper read the hindu newspaper daily you can refer indian express also all right or you can read both of them also if you are reading both of them you should finish both of these newspaper within 2 hours only okay including the monthly current affairs that you are daily giving the times let's say for uh, 20 minutes to 25 minutes that means both of these newspaper should be ideally finished in 1.5 hours only if you are reading these newspaper you should not give more than 1.5 hours for these two newspapers if you are if you are giving say 3 hours 4 hours it will it will be a wastage wastage of your time so uh, stick to 1.5 hours if you are reading only the hindu it should be finished roughly in 45 to 50 minutes only 45 to 50 minutes only i would suggest you to read the hindu in 45 to 50 minutes and read the editorial page editorial page of uh, the indian express in say next 15 to 20 minutes that's all that's all read the hindu newspaper completely and read the editorial section from the indian express and both should be finished in say 1.5 hours only and inclusive of your monthly current affairs this combined time should not exceed by more than 2 uh, hours per day all right so uh, so all the best guys we'll meet again tomorrow thank you very much